Steve Glair agus ber gate falta quick on ocod show er on tastas digital covid on angus orpig hello everyone from sunny dublin i'd like to warmly welcome you and our panel to this event on the eu digital covid certificate so this event is hosted in conjunction with the european parliament's liaison office in dublin here the European Commission in Ireland and European Movement Ireland. So it's wonderful to have you all here today. My name is Ashling Brady and I'm a broadcaster and producer with Irish Parliamentary Television, Arachus TV. I'm based in Leinster House in the heart of Irish politics in Irish Parliament. And hopefully with the assistance of the EU Digital COVID Certificate, I'll be back in Strasbourg soon. And um, recently we've all seen a lot in the news about the EU digital COVID certificate. So we have our panel here to be able to shed some light on as, as this certificate will be rolled out across all EU member states. So um, the, this certificate, as we've heard the debates in Parliament, Parliament there, as I was mentioning, this has been in the news a lot recently. And the final vote took place this week, passing with a clear endorsement of 546 votes in favour, 93 opposed and 51 um, abstentions. So a clear endorsement of this proposal. So the EU Digital Covid Certificate will be launched on the 1st of July across EU member states. Now, I know some EU member states are already rolling this out. In Ireland, we're set to link in on the 19th of July. So this will see the return of non-essential travel. So many families who have members living abroad will be united for the first time in a very, very long time. A lot of businesses will be able to get back up and travel again for business purposes. And of course, we'll see the return of the travel and tourism sector, which is vital for the recovery of the EU economy. So we have um, a large audience here today. So I, I'd invite you all to submit your questions. We'd be delighted to hear from you if you have any questions. You can submit them to events at europeanmovement.ie. Now, I think there's a scroller coming up on screen there for you all to see. And we'd like to encourage you all to tweet as well about this event and get some traction. So don't forget to use the hashtag, hashtag EU COVID certificate. And when tweeting, posting or sharing, make sure you use the handles EP in Ireland, which is the European Parliament in Ireland, Euro Ireland, which is the European Commission in Ireland, and EMI Ireland, which is the European Movement Ireland. And don't forget to tag our panellists here too. So on that note, joining us to discuss the EU Digital COVID Certificate, uh, we are in the company of, first of all, I'd like to introduce Monica Mosshammer, who is Deputy Head of the Union unit for unit for union citizenship rights and free movement she's also director general for justice and consumer consumers at the european commission her unit has been responsible for the eu digital covid certificate proposal adopted by the commission in march which we know the council and the european parliament has uh, later approved and we also have sophia intervelt an MEP from the Renew Group, a, a Dutch MEP from the Netherlands. We're delighted to have her here. And she is Shadow Rep Rapporteur on the EU Digital COVID Certificate Legislative Report uh, for the Renew Group. So we're delighted to have her here as well. We also have Irish MEPs, Billy Kelleher, who is also from the Renew Group, who represents the Ireland South constituency. And we have Deirdre Cloon, MEP with the European People's Party, who is also from the Ireland South constituency. So you're both very welcome. And I'm delighted to also um, invite Minister Ushin Smith, who is, a who is a Minister of State with responsibility for public procurement and e-government at the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. So we're delighted to have you here and you're all very welcome. So first of all, I'd like to invite Monica to make her opening statement on the EU Digital COVID Certificate. Thank you very much, Esling, and uh, good uh, morning or midday to, to, to Dublin. Uh, yes, I just wanted to present to you quickly what, what we have done uh, since the beginning of uh, the, the crisis, so because we are all aware of uh, the restrictions imposed by member states for public health reasons. Uh, member states can restrict free movement for that reasons, but of course they should uh, remain proportionate and non-discriminatory. 
Um, last uh, summer, um, or be end of uh, spring, we saw an improvement of the situation and member states uh, took back the restrictions, but uh, throughout the summer, uh, the situation uh, got worse, uh, which uh, then led the Commission to propose uh, a, a Council recommendation on introducing a coordinated approach. And I wanted to, to add that uh, before we go to the DCC, because there is a parallel development uh, that needs to be uh, taken uh, in, in, into account in, in, in this respect. So uh, in October, the Council then adopted uh, this uh, recommendation introducing maps, uh, green, orange and red, and measures that can be taken on travelers coming from uh, these regions. Um, these measures range from quarantine to testing, and uh, of course, member states wanted to have a proof for that. Um, and then we, we realized uh, that uh, there is no uh, harmonized format for that. And there were also falsifications around. So uh, member states uh, did not really trust uh, uh, that the certificates issued by other member states uh, would uh, be issued um, uh, to uh, a person which indeed has been uh, vaccinated, uh, recovered or uh, tested. And that's uh, the reason why we then in uh, March uh, on the 17th um, adopted uh, the proposal for the digital uh, COVID certificate, as it is called now, and not any longer digital green certificate. If I still use the old word, please forgive it. Uh, but it was a bit of uh, intense negotiations the last uh, two and a half uh, months. So I might have been brainwashed by the name as well. So, but what have we done with the digital green certificate? It encompasses three different um, certificates, namely a vaccination certificate, um, a recovery certificate and a test certificate. And what we have laid down that if a member state waives restrictions on travelers holding uh, such certificates, they should also waive it uh, for holders of certificates issued for third countries. Uh, that's very important because then we, we have uh, the, the non-discrimination uh, uh, between our citizens, but by, we also considered it to have the, the tests uh, on the same footing as the vaccines and uh, the uh, recovery certificate so that you have the right to get it and also the right to get in a digital format and a paper format so that we do not discriminate against vaccinated people. Um, the um, acceptance of uh, such certificates uh, is um, for, for the member states to uh, to decide. But as I said, if they uh, accept a, a certificate, they should also accept it from uh, should also lift the restrictions for holders of certificates issued uh, by uh, other member states. Um, on, on the details uh, for the vaccination certificate, member states are obliged uh, to accept uh, vaccines that have been EMA approved uh, from the European Medicine Agency, but they are not obliged uh, to um, uh, accept others. As far as tests are concerned, uh, uh, we've included a rapid antigen tests and PCR tests, and uh, recovery uh, tests are based on PCR tests um, um, only. Um, and after the 11th day, uh, you will then be able to get a, a certificate um, um, to, to show that you have recovered. How does the system work? Um, we have established um, a gateway through which uh, public keys are exchanged. So uh, the, um, uh, the person issuing a certificate will um, issue it with a, a private signature uh, and then through the exchange of public keys on the other side uh, uh, the verifier can uh, see whether indeed by using that public key whether uh, the uh, document has been issued by an authentic person. Um, this is very important because uh, that allows us to not to exchange uh, data um, via the EU Health Gateway, um, which was also an important point uh, for the Parliament, but uh, I suppose uh, Mrs. Innetfeld uh, will um, uh, elaborate a little bit further on that. What was also the outcome of the negotiations uh, that um, while Member States um, retained the possibility to um, uh, in impose restrictions um, uh, for public health reasons. Uh, they should refrain from uh, adding additional restrictions to holders of vaccination certificates and re recovery certificates, unless um, in a case of an emergency, uh, there is a new variant uh, of concern. Um, the commission also committed uh, to um, 
make 100 million euro available to the member states in order to support them uh, to provide for affordable tests uh, for citizens uh, because that is uh, of course always um, uh, a, a tricky issue while the certificate as such is free of charge the underlying tests not necessarily are free some member states do issue them free of charge others don't and it was very important uh, for the parliament and we, we were happy to take it up uh, to support member states to provide for affordable tests in particular for those persons crossing the border on a regular basis and um, you mentioned yes it was uh, adopted yesterday um, uh, approved by the parliament with uh, 549 uh, votes in favor which we very much appreciated uh, the council will uh, adopt uh, uh, to tomorrow i think so signature can then take place um, early next uh, week and in parallel we've also worked on the famous recommendations that i uh, mentioned um, in the in the beginning uh, which should lead uh, to waiving restrictions for all vaccinated uh, persons and persons who are in possession of uh, the recovery certificate with these recommendations also the thresholds for uh, coloring the different uh, regions um, uh, will be slightly changed because uh, we think that uh, with uh, the vaccination um, um, uh, improving uh, in all member states the situation is getting better so that we uh, increase the thresholds that um, more people uh, coming from a green or orange uh, region uh, can then also uh, travel easily Monica, um, I, to I just you. wanted to say uh, that's my overview and sorry for <laughs> having uh, oh, taken so much time. You're only one minute over, don't worry. So, but we will come back to all the, the issues that you addressed in your opening statement. So thank you very much. So next we are going to welcome um, Sophia Intervelt to make her opening statement. Okay, thank you very much and hello Dublin from Strasbourg. Uh, I am particularly personally pleased that we uh, are making progress with this certificate that it has been adopted because I can tell you traveling from Belgium, Brussels to Strasbourg in France, back to Belgium and then to the Netherlands is uh is is impossible to you know it's impossible to figure out what to do, which rules to follow, uh etc. Um, so I'm very pleased. I'm also very proud that the European Parliament has adopted this uh, not only um, in, in, in record time, we have worked very fast, uh, but as the figures shown uh, show, uh, it was also, there was very, very broad consensus amongst all the political groups. It has really been endorsed by the vast majority uh, of all the political groups uh, from left to right in the European Parliament, and that is a good thing. However, um, the negotiations with the, the Council, i.e. the Member States, have been incredibly tough, uh, and there are still things in the outcome that we are, <coughs> sorry, um, a bit unhappy about. Uh, and we're going to see how it's going to work out in practice. Parliament had two major priorities. One was we want to end this impossible patchwork, this almost, you know, it's a spaghetti of rules and restrictions and regulations that nobody can, uh, can follow. We feel that if you have a certificate, that should really be, uh, you know, what, what, what gives you freedom to, to travel. The second thing is uh, because there are the three uh, certificates, so vaccination-based, recovery-based or, or test-based, we felt that there should not be any discrimination between the three. And as vaccination is free in all member states, we felt testing should also be free, testing for the, the purpose of the certificate. Um, I'm afraid on both issues, we've, uh, we've, we've not fully achieved what we wanted. Um, it is really remarkable to see how member state governments were really more attached to preserving their uh, their prerogatives to to take measures to take national measures rather than making it possible for citizens to 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 travel carefree and i think i would like to remind everybody every european citizen has the right to free movement that right has not disappeared because of COVID. So, um, and this certificate is only necessary because the member states, even if, as Mrs. Mosamer said, uh, the, the member states in principle have agreed on a common uh, COVID map of Europe, in practice, 
they're all applying different rules and different norms and changing the rules uh, the whole time. We wanted, wanted to end that uh, and that did not fully succeed. Are the member states now going to try and stick more to these common standards, the common guidelines? I very much hope so, because I think that, that citizens need it. And this is not just for holidays. This is also for people who travel for work, who travel for family purposes, people who on the mainland, you know, live in border areas and they have to shuttle across the border the whole time for work, school, groceries, living, uh, etc. As to the free tests, uh, there too, the council, the, the member states did not want to agree. However, we did secure uh, an additional 100 million euros in funding to make tests, free tests available to people who need it most. Uh, and we are currently working on raising that uh, amount even more. And that is, of course, on top of the, the free tests which are being made available in some of the member states, like in France, where all testing um, is free. So, um, in conclusion, I, I think this certificate is really going to be a great help in regaining our freedom and our right to free movement. Um, but a lot depends on how the member states are going to apply it, uh, when they will introduce it, and if indeed they're going to refrain from additional and basically unnecessary national restrictions, but if they will all uh, use the same roadmap, the same COVID map, uh, quite literally, uh, and, and make it as easy as possible for the citizens. So okay. having said that, I would like to wish everybody already a very good summer. Thank you, Sophie. So next, we are going to have Billy Kelleher with his opening statement on the EU Digital COVID Certificate. Uh, th th thanks very much, Ashling. Also, greetings from um, Strasbourg. I think I'm just opposite uh, Sophie here in the corridor, actually. But um, just to say that, you know, even getting to Strasbourg uh, um, from Strasbourg as an Irish citizen is quite difficult. It's quite onerous. Uh, it's not a, a complaint. It's just the observation of the fact that you have to fill in so many forms. You, um, there's limited flight options. All of this is because of the COVID pandemic itself. So we first and foremost have to acknowledge that we are in a public health emergency. Uh, the basic measures that were put in place by countries over the last year plus were, were there to save lives, reduce the spread of, of the, the virus itself. But now we have come to a stage where, you know, we see the rollout of vaccines across the continent. It is having a profound impact on the numbers of people who are contracting uh, the disease, but also in, ending up in hospitals. In other words, there's a, a major COVID bonus uh, now happening across uh, the, the, the continent and that's that's very welcome even uh, in the context of Ireland itself I mean some of the largest hospitals have now reported that they have no COVID patients um, uh, in their hospitals and that is an indication that we really now are at the cusp of something that's exciting in terms of opening up our economies um, getting people back uh, to normal uh, business uh, getting families in connected and making sure that business and commerce and trade can operate across the continent and Sophie referenced a very important point I mean the first uh, is that we all countries and governments are obliged to try and protect our citizens in terms of the public health emergency that was there. But equally, there's another very important right, and that's the right to free movement uh, and you know the right to travel and to be able to move freely across the European Union. And that is an inalienable right that can't be just undermined uh, very, very easily. And I do think that because of where we are, um, the public health measures, the vaccination programme, the dropping uh, number and in hospitals is an indication that we can now embrace the digital COVID uh, certificate. And I was a proponent of this uh, as, for a long time as well. I always felt that there needed to be a harmonised approach across uh, the continent. And the reason being, uh, I, I witnessed myself firsthand at airports, the chaos that you know people were presenting documents. Um, uh, very often you, they were printed off, um, no way of making sure they were genuine, how you could authenticate them. Um, there was obviously forgeries and, uh, and you know, you'd see people presenting screenshots at, uh, at boarding gates, etc. So there was no uniform way of uh, ensuring that any document that was presented was authentic. Uh, it either was a vaccine certificate, it was a recovery certificate, or it was a test certificate. And uh, I do welcome uh, what has been announced. From an Irish perspective, let's be very uh, honest. I mean, you know, the 19th of July is the day that we have decided that we're going to embrace uh, th th that concept. And I hope 
And I think this is a very important that it is for all citizens, not just people who want to come into the country, but that there is a quid pro quo for people wanting to travel from Ireland out as well. Now, we don't have any additional barriers uh, for people wanting to leave uh, or, or, or people coming in. That we treat every European citizen uh, in a uniform, fair uh, and equitable manner. So from that perspective, uh, I, I sincerely hope that we can um, embrace the technology, number one, get it up and running, and that we can then uh, enter into the spirit of it. In other words, that we treat all European citizens. Oh, okay, equally. thank you. And there, uh, an emergency break mechanism. So, yeah, I just want to say there is an emergency break okay. situation mm -hmm. in place, whereby in the event of an epidemiological change um, yeah. uh, with the virus, yeah. that countries can uh, address it as well. So that's an important point Member as well. States so look, battery. overall, I very much welcome it. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, Billy. So um, I'm just conscious that we get some time to ask our panelists questions. So now I would like to invite uh, Deirdre Clune, MEP with the European People's Party, uh, to make her statement. And is the line freezing there for us? Can you? I hope I'm having. Can you hear me? Do you, do you hear us? Oh, yeah. I mean, you're back yeah. now. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, you can hear you now, yeah. I can hear you perfectly, yes. Uh, okay to go. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I had a perfect connection earlier on. But now, anyway, listen, thanks, every Thank you. And thanks for the opportunity to be here and to sh share all the information for Monica and to Sophie. Thank you for your work that you've done. I know it's been, it's been, um, it hasn't been easy. <laughs> At, at some point, but I think from the, from the moment the Parliament voted that we wanted to fast track this initiative and we would give it our uh, 100, almost 100% support, I, I think we have been, uh, it's been very effective and things have moved. So we're at the point now um, where there's a high expectation there from citizens that this uh, certificate will be available uh, to them. Um, for those who want to travel, absolutely, it's very important for a tourist industry. But also, it could be, I'm very conscious of people who, um, from families who haven't seen family members, who have been who haven't been able to just sit, sit down around a table with their families for, for over 15 months now. And it is quite, um, when you step back, when you think about it, it is a very, very difficult situation for them. So I think we have to bear, bear that in mind as well. It's very important. So, you know, we're at the point now where we're going to have to, uh, Parliament has agreed we want to strike a balance, uh, recognising that the balance has to be struck between what member states in terms of protecting uh, the health of their of their citizens, uh, watching the epidemi epidemiological situation as it may advance in some cases and may not. And so that balance is there now in trying to integrate the the um, court the the traffic light system, hopefully um, with with this with the certificate. But uh, I, for all the reasons that the previous speakers have said, you know, I'm very much welcome and supportive. We need, we need to make it uh, easier to travel now. Um, and as as we've seen, like up to 50 50 percent of European citizens have had their first dose of their vaccine. So we're in a very different situation uh, than we were at the beginning of this year, and and that's very positive. And we can see it in the numbers in in hospital cases uh, reducing all the time. And that, that, that to me has always been, been a very strong measure. So um, you, I, 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 I again would like to repeat the, the chaos that can, the potential chaos at our airports. You've seen it with um, the testing certs. Uh, I've seen a couple of times I've been asked for my, obviously all the time for your PCR test within 72 days, but then some airlines and some airports will want to see your actual appointment to verify that it isn't that the test result you have isn't isn't a forgery. Now, so you know that's what's out. That's potentially what's out there. The same in vaccine. So we need something that has this QR code that is uh, authentic authenticated and can be used to get people to to facilitate uh, easier movement through our airports. Because at the moment, some airline at the moment now airlines won't give a boarding pass beforehand. You have to present yourself at the airport, which I can understand. Uh, but so, so so something as something as simple, if you like, as, as a, this certificate uh, on your phone or in, on your hand uh, with, the, with the QR code uh, can make an enormous difference. So, you know, um, would tread cautiously, tread carefully. Uh, I know from airlines looking at airlines and what they're expecting, expecting maybe this, this month to be 50% of their 2019 levels is not quite the same for Ireland, but across Europe, uh, Euro control 
figures would stay, stay about 50% of levels of 2019 in, in, in July, expecting it to actually go up to 70, almost 80% in some cases. So, um, so that is encouraging. And I know the European um, Centre for Disease Control and EASA, the European Air Safety Association, are preparing revised guidelines now that they're going to produce 15th of June to next week on uh, how to make our airport safe, how to how to move forward in terms of safe travel, social distancing, hygiene, and what passengers can expect when they're traveling through the airport, airports and indeed on, on aircraft. So uh, those standards will be very important. And it's good to see the two bodies, the uh, European Center for, Disease, Center for Disease Control and EAS are working together on that. They did so previously last year, but I mean, we all know how, how little travel there was last year. So, um, I mean, I'm not going to repeat everything that's been, that's been said already. I think it's a, a positive move. Uh, I think particularly we're going to see um, for, for in Ireland, I, I look forward to hope getting engagement with other member states outside the European Union, in particular, I'm thinking of the United Kingdom and the US, which we would have a lot of travel in this country to ensure the certificate that we have developed in Europe, that that, that can be recognised and, and vice versa, because we do have a lot of travel, a lot of families who want to communicate from those two jurisdictions. So on the whole, positive. I look forward to the member states now hopefully agreeing or recognising that there will be um, different approaches in different countries. And, you know, we have to tread cautiously and, and strike that balance at this point. So thank you. Thank, you. thank you very much, Deirdre. Thank you for the, that opening statement. And now we are going to move to the minister who is going to give his opening address. I think people are uh, keenly anticipating details on how this is going to be rolled out in Ireland. Hello, everybody. Um, great to be here and thank you for inviting me to speak at this. Uh, it's interesting that there are different aspects to this. There's a, a transport aspect and then there's a health aspect. Uh, there's a European aspect. And it's good to have different people from those different perspectives here together. My, my perspective is that I'm an engineer. So I'm looking at this in the classic idea of what is the problem and what is the solution? So the problem that we have is free movement. People are not able, able to move easily around Europe. And the knock-on consequence of that is a loss of free movement, a loss of connectivity in Europe, and also damage to the tourism industry. So what's causing that and how do we fix it? So the cause, and this has been alluded to by other speakers, which isn't often talked about, is that people are arriving at European airports with pieces of paper that say that they're vaccinated or say they've been tested. And it's very hard to determine if those pieces of paper or those screenshots on phones are authentic, are they valid? It's very easy to knock up an A4 sheet of paper, buy one on the internet, or you can make something in Microsoft Paint and stick it on your phone and turn up, and there's no way really to validate it. And part of the problem is the length of time it takes to validate these different documents. So people arrive at an airport, and typically one of the stages you go through is that somebody has to authenticate your passport. And there's a, there's a place, there's a, there's a mechanism, there's equipment, there's a standard um, uh, for passports. And it, it is possible to, to determine whether a passport is genuine or not and whether it attaches to that person. We don't have that infrastructure for determining whether somebody has really passed a COVID test or whether somebody is really, is really vaccinated. And you can imagine somebody can show up from anywhere in the world, they've got a piece of paper saying that they went to some particular test lab or some particular vaccination center perhaps privately run, and that they're, that they're okay. How do, how do we trust that? And because of that lack of trust, that then translates into member states imposing very strict rules on travel. So it's the lack of trust that, that leads to the, to, to the restrictions, and it also leads to inefficiency. And inefficiency in an airport is not so bad when you're only running at 5 or 10% of normal, normal uh, passenger levels. But what happens when we return to um, the type of uh, the type of volumes of passengers that we had in previous years, they're simply not going to get through the airport in that time. And secondly, there is a problem with the risk of infection when you have thousands of people crowded into an airport, unhappy, waiting to, to, to get through um, because it's taking so long to check all their various documents. So the, the idea of, of these certificates is that you have a mutually recognized and acceptable document which can be scanned quickly. So you arrive at a, at a, at a counter, there's a QR code in the corner, somebody scans it, it goes beep, green, you can go through so that we get the efficiency, but also it's a digital signature. 
So it's using public key encryption. There's a private key and a public key. We know that that's a genuine document that has been signed by an authority that we trust. In other words, a member state has signed it. And that, that government is guaranteeing that that person has been vaccinated or has been tested or has recovered from, from COVID. So that, that, that's, what the, that's what the proposed solution is. Uh, and, um, and it's just important to just uh, keep a focus on that, on, on, on what we're trying to do. So in January in Ireland, we, um, the HSE developed its own in-house uh, vaccination certificate system. They started issuing vaccination certificates to uh, a pilot group of HSE staff, and they've been doing that since. So we had something to work on until the, uh, the, the European proposed digital COVID cert um, specifications were, were, were produced. And since then, we've been, adopting, we've been adapting what we've done to, to what's required. So we've got two real challenges here. One is technical. So just issuing the certs is one thing, and, and uh, that, that's absolutely fine. The second problem is, is policy. So what are, once you've got one of these certificates, you know, is, it, what, is somebody going to accept it at the other end? Where are they going to check it? What are the rules going to be? So these, what these certificates say is, they say when you got a vaccine dose, which vaccine you got, or else they say um, which tests you've had and when you had them. It doesn't say whether somebody is going to let you in with this particular with this particular document. In other words, it's not a travel document. It's not a guarantee that you're going to be admitted. And every country was allowed, certainly at the start, every country was 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 told that they could set their own individual policies on uh, on on admission. So every country can determine what's their threshold for for admitting somebody. Now I, see, I think we are moving now towards if you're vaccinated, you can be admitted, which which certainly seems to make sense. But we're in a, an evolving policy area between now, 1st of July, and our, our target date, the 19th of July, where those rules are changing, and they're changing according to the changing risk uh, that's happening. So to give you an example, uh, a topic that's been much in the media is antigen testing. The specification for these, so there are two aspects to, to, to an antigen test. There's whether we're technically going to include it on a COVID cert, and then whether it will be accepted by the other government at the other end, at the, by, at, at the receiving airport. So the specification says antigen tests can go on. Particular types of antigen tests can be included in, in the certificate, so they will be. Um, but you might arrive at a country that doesn't accept those antigen tests as, uh, as being possible to, to travel. So it is still a complex situation and it is a challenge. There's also a questions began to arise about civil rights. Uh, you know, will these vaccination certs be used to prevent you from doing your normal, going about your normal business? In other words, for go and go to a restaurant. And we clearly laid down policy at the start that we wouldn't do that, that it would be for travel. Um, last week, I met uh, transport ministers last Thursday at the Council of Ministers. And I discussed this uh, both in a group and with individual ministers about the various challenges that were there. And one of the things I got to see was what it's like going through an airport in practice. Uh, and um, it is very inefficient. Going through, going, going through an airport, there are um, a, a lot of people queuing up. And the, the, the process of checking the certificates is, is, is not, um, it, it doesn't look like it's very thorough. There is an, an, another issue that arises is what happens when somebody tests um, positive when they're abroad. How will they come home, particularly in a family holiday? If a group is away on a family holiday and one of the children tests positive before they leave, how are they going to isolate? That, that needs a sort of an, an insurance solution. So we have three types of certificate referred to. We've got, we've got vaccination certificates. I'll just give you some information about how we're getting on with them. Initially, vaccination certificates are clearly um, the most important of them all because they're the longest lasting. Uh, after that, recovery certificates, which are also, which, which will last for a period of months, and test certs. And test certificates are very ephemeral. They only last for that couple of days before you arrive in. So they don't really have much, a test cert from a month ago really, really, really doesn't have much value. So with vaccination certs, we're ready at the moment to issue 1 million vaccination certs, which are uh, those that went through our vaccination registration portal. We have another 1.3 million um, that would be issued based on data from GPs. Uh, in terms of recovery certificates, about a quarter million people have, we, on our system, are, we have recorded as having recovered from, um, from COVID in the last nine months. So that's another quarter million that we, that we could issue right away. And for the test certificates, we are working with um, individual laboratories to uh, accredit those laboratories and to set up data feeds so that when they test somebody, that, that those test results can come in and be used as, as, a, as a signed certificate for people to travel. Um, so the, the, the system is being developed in-house. 
the work has mostly been done by the uh, by the agency. It's in coordination with my staff in the Office of Government Chief Information Officer, and there's in a senior officials group under the Taoiseach's department that's coordinating between uh, other other departments around the government because, of course, health is involved, and of course, tourism is involved, and transport is involved. So, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. So, Minister, um, I have a number of questions for you to start with. So, for people who for attendees who are watching today, so say they book their flight, for example, to France, to Spain, they're going on business or they're engaging in tourism. How how is the system going to work, and where will they receive the certificate from? So, your certificate will be well for the start. We, our, our go live date is the nineteenth of July. So, um, so any travel before then, you're 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 not going to be able to get a certificate before that date. So, you you and you have the 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 um, the the government will issue your certificate based on your on the the records they have of your vaccination. We had obviously a, a ransomware attack on the HSE. Uh, a lot of systems were disabled or slowed down. But luckily, the vaccination system was on the cloud, very recently developed, and and survived uh, un, unhurt. But it has it has delayed some of the the feeds into into GPs and so on. So what will happen is that your your cert will be issued to you by email, uh, and uh, and will be available for you to either um, to to download, uh, or you can opt to have it printed out and post it to your address. Now the question is, will it be this? We we can issue with a cert, but will it be accepted at the other end? And that, that, so that, that's, really the, that's really the big question. And what will the rules be for the country that you're planning to visit? I think you gave Germany as an example. So let's say you're planning to go to Germany in August. What will the rules be on admission to Germany in August? And it, that, that's really something that's, that's difficult to predict. So there is an element of risk still attached. Okay, and, and we'll, come back, we'll come back to that question because we have Sophia and we have Monica here who might be able to sh shed some light on that. But in terms, so, so for, um, our citizens or people living in Ireland and if they're going to book their flight, who do they ask for the search or where do they go to get the search? Like is it that the HSC will automatically issue this or, you know, what what are the practical steps to actually go and avail of a search? So the HSC has the email addresses. They have, they have they have better data on the people who registered through the portal than they do on the people who registered through through GPs. We do have everybody's uh, contact details through GPs, of course, but we have we actually have email address and SMS uh, data, phone numbers for, for everybody who registered through through the portal. So we can instantly contact one million people by email and offer them offer them their certificate. Say to them, you you were vaccinated, uh, you can you you are eligible for for um, a certificate on your phone, and you can opt to have it have it posted out to you. So they will all be offered it. There's no cost to the issuance of these certs. Okay, and so for the likes of people who've been vaccinated or say for people who have received a negative PCR test or people who are not vaccinated, how will it work for them? Uh, so it's so if you're if you're not vaccinated, how does it, how does it work? Is that your question? Yeah. yeah so yeah. If, if you're not if you're not vaccinated, next question is have you recovered from COVID in the last nine months? If you haven't, and if you if you haven't, then the question is uh, is it, that then your, your your last option is to get tested. And to get tested, you need to go to an approved um, uh, testing uh, operation, one of the laboratories that, that, that is accredited by the, by the state, which will be listed on the HSE's website. You go along to them, you get tested within uh, the 72 hours of your flight, and you, you get issued with uh, a certificate, which is, again, is emailed out to you or, or posted to you as you prefer for you to use on your, on your travel. And the question of PCR tests and the cost of PCR tests, that, have, that has come up. I understand that the EU are allocating 100 million funds. Do we know if that's going to be available to, to Irish people wishing to go abroad to reduce the cost of PCR tests? Yeah, I, I, I saw that news. I think it's very welcome. Uh, and I think, I guess it's a, it's a reaction to the fact that, it, that PCR tests are expensive. And particularly if you're bringing a family and you've got children, who can't be vaccinated because of their age. So vaccination is, is not permitted uh, below certain ages that the drugs are simply not, not authorized for that age. So in practice, children have to, have to be tested. And if each test costs you know, 100 euros, then you're, you're into, a, into an, a very difficult situation where it, it becomes too expensive to travel. So it is a real problem. Um, the, uh, the, the policy at the moment uh, is that the state is not gonna pay for the, 
for the PCR tests and that you'll have to be privately tested. Um, uh, and the but I do note that the this announcement of 100 million to subsidize those costs and we'll certainly be engaging to find out. Um, I'm sure we're entitled to a share of it yeah. and to see to see what how, how, what the mechanism is for that and how, how we would operate that and how we can subsidize tests. And just two more questions before I bring in other panelists. So once the 19th of July, um, once we hit the 19th of July, restrictions such as fines or mandatory hotel quarantine will obviously go. But um, for Northern Irish citizens, what's the case for them? Will they be able to opt into this uh, system if they, if they wish to do so? So there are ongoing um, intense negotiations with the UK over travel. I mean, I think we had originally hoped we could get a travel bubble with, with the UK, um, which would get to get the common travel area working again. And I think that was delayed by uh, concerns about the Delta variant. Um, but I know that the UK is looking at a very similar system to the, uh, to the, to the DCC, to the digital um, COVID cert, and is working directly with the EU, and I believe in a, in a very um, uh, cooperative and productive way. So I think that it, it's absolutely within, um, certainly British people do like to travel around Europe traditionally, and I think that they, they, they are going to want uh, the same freedoms that the rest of us have to, to move around. Uh, and it is in their interest to arrive at a system uh, which is very similar and mutually acceptable. So I, I think that's that's the direction we're going. But it, it is, um, I, sorry, one, one other detail I give on this is that if you travel, if you think about this, if you travel to another country and you, you're not vaccinated and you want to get a test cert to come home again, you're going to have to apply for a test cert from the country in which you're in. So you're, you're going to have to get a, a you're going to have to get a, a test. So in other words, member states are going to have to issue test certs to non-citizens as well as their own citizens. And they're going to have to, so th which is which is a complication because they don't have ID information on, on foreign citizens. And if, in fact, if anybody from the from the panel who's <laughs> has has thought a little bit more about that, that that's going to be complex. So you're coming home from your holiday in Portugal to Ireland, and you you need you need to get you you need to get your test cert from the Portuguese authorities, which is which is a, an, another step again. So it, it it adds to the complexity. So actually, just picking up on that point, and we, we touched on it earlier, mm. you know, if, say, for example, you're, and I'm going to put this to Sophie, as I know Sophie is keen to come in, and you have been across this and following all the negotiations very closely. So if, for example, you're you're in Ireland and you're traveling from Ireland to Portugal or France or wherever it may be in the EU, you know, how much of a guarantee can you give to people that I suppose the system will be, I suppose, uh, a similar approach across all member states, and that it's straightforward, that once you you know, arrive in another member state that you'll be able to return quite, you know, quite seamlessly, which I suppose is what the aim of the EU digital COVID certificate is. Well, that's what we wanted to achieve, that you can travel seamlessly. Um, it may well be the case if member states are of goodwill, but um, uh, when, when uh, I think one of the important things that the minister said at the start is that this this whole situation has arisen not as a result of the virus, but as a result of lack of trust between the member states and lack of, uh, let's say, interoperability and 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 no, you know, mutual recognition. That's the real problem. If you look at the United States. They have everything we have. They have vaccination, they have testing, they have mouth masks, they have lockdowns, they have quarantines, they have self-isolation, they have everything, everything, everything. The one thing they don't have is uh, actual, you know, you don't need a certificate to travel across the United States. Uh, the only reason we need this certificate is because the member states do not have the same approach and they actually refuse to take the same approach. Mm -hmm. That is the real problem. So we're trying to solve a problem which has created not by has been created not by the virus, but by the lack of coordination and harmonization between uh, the member states. So yes, there will still be a lot of questions. I think the one problem that the certificate solves is, uh, I think Billy described it earlier, uh, is when you get to, for example, the airport or whatever, you cross the border, that uh, if you have the certificate, uh, that it will be recognized. You know, they're not going to say like, oh, what is this piece of paper? Huh? Ireland, we don't know this. No, you, you can't enter. They have to recognize the certificate. So that's that's a good thing. Whether, I mean, member states can still unilaterally 
uh, impose additional restrictions. And uh, so people still, if they travel, you know, I would always recommend uh, do try and find out what the situation is. Um, uh, 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 contact people on the spot because there may still be additional restrictions. Um, I do okay. hope that it's going to be just solved. On that point, I know. Um, sorry to interrupt you there, Sophie. I just I'm conscious that uh, Billy Keller has to go at one o'clock, and I know Monica wanted to come in on the whole, I suppose, um, harmonisation of the process across EU member states, and if you're travelling from one country to another. So, Monica, I know you have some points to add to that. Yeah, thank you very much, Hensling. Uh, as uh, Mrs. Innitfeld uh, just mentioned, it is, of course, crucial that uh, the information uh, is available on the, the uh, respective um, restrictions that are in place. And that was one uh, element that we very much insisted upon during the negotiations that member states need to give timely information, both to citizens, but also to stakeholders, airline companies, and so on and so forth. But um, I would like to come back to, to, to the recommendation that I uh, mentioned in my introductory statement uh, that we, we hope to be finalized uh, soon and approved uh, by the Council, where indeed for vaccinated people and um, persons holding a recovery certificates that uh, these restrictions should be lifted. Of course, we are aware we are in the field of the recommendation, Mrs. Enetfeld also mentioned before, not all member states uh, always apply our recommendations. Um, yes, we, we are aware of that risk, but uh, nevertheless, um, I think we, we, we are really moving in, in, in the right direction uh, and, and moving in the right directions to, to be able to lift restrictions because that's what we really want to do, lifting all these restrictions to, to the free movement, which unfortunately have been introduced based on this virus, but with all the vaccination uptake, we really hope that we are uh, coming back uh, to, to a situation where we can all enjoy uh, our fundamental right of uh, free movement again. But Thank information is crucial. And before you travel, really always look at the respective websites. And Reopen EU has been created for, for that particular purpose as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Martha. And just to bring in Billy um, Kelleher there, Billy, you mentioned the emergency brake system. I suppose while restrictions are easing now and we're seeing the return of non-essential travel, how, is, how important is it that member states can impose an emergency brake or governments can make decisions to reimpose restrictions as, you know, I suppose for travel, there is still a, a risk of variance or, you know, a, a deterioration situation. Well, I mean, look, public health must come first and foremost, and we all accept that. So, I mean, it was an issue that, you know, um, people were concerned about that in the event of there being a variant or there being a major change in the epidemiological situation of a country or a region, uh, well, then that there would be some opportunity to provide a, an emergency break. In other words, uh, they could uh, enforce uh, stricter uh, restrictions. Uh, and, and that is still the case. And I think what is very important, and I think we're going to have to really put a lot of thought into this, and Minister uh, Smith did point it out, uh, I, I won't see huge difficulties, I think, in terms of people presenting a vaccine um, certificate or a recovery certificate. The key issue will be, though, if you go to another country and you either contract uh, COVID-19 or you need to get tested to come back to a, another country, uh, will you be able to avail of testing in, 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 a, in another country? Will it be easily done? Um, can it be authenticated? Uh, these are the, are the key issues. And the other very, very important factor as well, in the event of many people, we'll say, leaving a country and all of a sudden restrictions being imposed, you could have many, many people discommoded not being able to return. So we, we like we, so we have to have a monitoring of this and a, a very very in depth monitoring of it because you could have a situation where many many people could be locked out of a country for a period of time after going on good faith with the digital certificate or with this COVID certificate and then being unable to return because of restrictions being imposed by a member state and that clearly does require um, a lot of thought and um, I think almost independent assessment rather than member states just making a unilateral decision. It has to be based on the European Centre for Disease Control. It has to be based on other issues just than the member state itself. I would be very, very worried otherwise if it was just down to that particular issue. And I suppose for a lot of people travelling as well, there may be language barriers if you you know, end up in a member state where maybe English isn't as efficient or whatever it may be. So there are a lot of complexities with this. Yes, and also, actually, I just think that the other issue of concern would be the exploitation of the cost of PCR testing. Um, you know, if you were going to a country 
um, uh, it's a big tourist country. You go in, the only way you can get out is by having a PCR test. Well, look, if it's just down to the market, you know what will happen. So we have to be very conscious of those issues as well uh, to facilitate travel. Okay, I'm just conscious of time here, so I'm going to go to some questions. There's a lot of questions. We've had huge response to this uh, from our panel, so I'm going to just put some questions to Deirdre first. Um, so what is the reason why fully vaccinated passengers from across the UK and Europe have to wait until July 19th, 19th nearly a further six weeks to enter the country without quarantine and testing requirements? So I suppose why that delay to the 19th of July rather than like with the rest of EU member states where they're beginning on the 1st of July? Well, um, I mean, that's that's a decision for the Irish government. We're not, that's been said. Uh, we're going to open up the country for tra well, travel. Non-essential travel will start on the 19th of July. Is that Sorry, I just missed it. There was a break up there. Is it for travellers coming, people coming into Ireland or going out? Or so Ireland? what is the, what is the reason why fully vaccinated passengers from across the UK and Europe, so as if they're coming into Ireland. So I suppose yeah, the, the EU COVID certificate is live from the 1st of July, but we're not entering it until the 19th. Until the 19th of July, that's a decision by, by the Irish government. And, and, and that's, I mean, that's what we've, we've, tried, what we've been talking about. There are going to be different reactions across, across different member states. So, um, um, until, and, 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 and anyway, Ireland won't have our own, we won't have our own certificate for, tra for passengers, for, for travellers leaving Ireland until the 19th, as the Minister has just outlined there. So, and actually, um, Minister, I might come back to you, and I know you addressed the issue of antigen testing, but is this likely to be accepted in Ireland into the future, or will it just be PCR tests? So this is the, this is, and it's the same as the last question, this is the, the division between the technical issue of certificates uh, and then the policy that goes with them that decides who's allowed into your country or not. So, you know, you're going to, you're going to, I can give you a, a, a certificate that says you've had an antigen test, but will, 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 the, will the responding country receive that? Ireland's policy about who's, about what, what restrictions, what, what level of surety you have to give before you enter is determined by the government on the advice of the Minister for Health and the Minister for Health is advised by, by NEFIT. So that, that, that's what the, the the chain of advice is there. It's absolutely completely separate from uh, digital COVID certs. So if the, the, at, the, at present, you need to have a negative PCR test to enter Ireland. That's what, that for everybody. And that, that's, what the, that's what the health policy is. In order to change the health policy, the Department of Health and the Minister for Health would have to say that they had determined that in fact, that the, the level of risk had reduced to a, to a stage where they didn't need a negative PCR tests, that a vaccination cert would be enough, particularly one that was provable, and that uh, and, um, and then they would bring that to the to the government to the cabinet to to agree that hasn't happened yet but it's a separate process from the from covid certs yep. so pcr tests uh are, are the standard and that's what's going to be uh, required um, so that's what the standard is at the moment but like the, i see that the policy is rapidly evolving all across europe and it's actually hard to keep up with you know you want to see which countries are accepting what to enter and it just adds to the to the complexity uh, of of trying to plan any kind of trip and this, Minister, may be another um, question for you. Ireland currently has laws in place that fines the use of 2K for non-essential travel to other EU countries. Will this be in contravention of the agreement after July 1st? So will passengers, I suppose, arriving from other EU member states, I suppose, will all those fines or any restrictions, will they be foregone? Will they be removed come July 1st? Yeah, I th so my, my understanding is that that the restrictions that that restrictions on travel, the restrictions on entry to any member state are still a competence of every member state. So every member state is entitled to make it to make its own rules. Now I may be I, I may be corrected on that. Maybe there has been a common agreement that vaccination will be accepted after after July first, and I stand to be corrected. And perhaps Monica might want to come in there. Can I say something on that? Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah, go ahead. Because this is this is the whole problem, you see, uh, and uh, Billy also alluded to it. The member states last year, October, have decided or have agreed on a common COVID map. You know, the map with the the green and the yellow and the orange and the and the red. The point is that in practice, in practice, the member states do not follow that. They each have their their own national recommendations and their national maps, and if at least. Uh, the, the member states would accept that the people who are in the ECDC, the European Centre of Disease Control, 
are experts. They know what they're talking about. They're pooling all the information coming in from Europe. And if they would all follow that single recommendation, then at least citizens would have some indication. There would be some logic. The problem is that because public health has so far not been a uh, an area uh, where the European no. Union had many competences, uh, you can see that ministers of public health are very they're they're very uh, you know protective of their 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 own powers and their own prerogatives. But I would say, and this is what the, the entire European Parliament has said, isn't it much more important? Um, that we give freedom back to the citizens, that we, we think about how can we uh, allow them to travel uh, again. And of course, it will be completely safe if they all would follow, if all the member states would follow this single recommendation by the ECDC. Okay, and Monica, would you like to come in on that? Yeah, thank you very much. Indeed, we are in the finalization or the, the council is in the finalization of uh, the negotiations on the, the this recommendation. And um, I understand that there is broad support for waiving restrictions for vaccinated um, and recovery uh, certificate holders. And uh, we would, of course, and um, if uh, the process is going sm smoothly, as yes, I would expect it, uh, this recommendation could be adopted next week. Uh, so we uh, hope, of course, uh, while knowing that this is a recommendation, we nevertheless um, have 27 member states around the table and uh, we, we expect and hope that uh, this uh, uh, common agreement uh, will then also be implemented in, in, in practice. Okay, and I'm just going to come back to some questions as we're getting a lot of engagement on this panel discussion. So, Minister, this might be one for you as well. It's a question from the Dublin Airport Authority. So, which ident or entity should ideally take Sorry, my friend's up there. Which entity should ideally take responsibility for checking for the checking of the digital EU co or the EU digital COVID certificate? An airline, a pre-departure or border management unit on arrival, as the search is currently not a mandatory travel document. Can an airline deny intra-EU travel if a passenger does not possess one? So yeah, the think... asking about whether it's mandatory. And I suppose who is taking, which entity is taking responsibility for it in the airport? Yeah, so I think this is this is a really important question because again, I can issue I can issue these certificates to people, but what is the what is the passenger journey? Like what happens in practice when you show up at an airport with this? It, there have to be pre-departure che checks because you can't be sending people home routinely for showing up with, with the wrong piece of paper at the other end. So that has to be that has to be done at boarding. And then at the other end, then then there has to be somebody who's checking. Uh, there has to be border control who are, who are checking the certs at, at the other end as well so you you you, you do you do require t two levels of checking and it also draws attention to the fact that there are there that this and this that it is complex because you have the health department of your country interacting with the the airport authority interacting with the airlines and interacting with border control which is you know with, i mean it, 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 it is it, it is a complex thing to set up but in fact what is happening at the moment is something similar but much but much less efficient where the, where people are trying to check negative pcr tests there is an infrastructure for that they are looking at things they're trying to validate them they're ringing phone numbers on them so there there is an existing system and it's really just a, a more efficient version of that mm -hmm. okay and uh, judith i just saw you put your hand up there do you want to come in on this just a quick point on that um the minister saying i mean i, I think like if i'm flying from Dublin to Brussels now. Okay, I, I will be pre clear. I will have to cross the border to get into Brussels in Belgium in the in the airport in Belgium. But flying from but normally if you're flying from Amsterdam, which I would do too, through Amsterdam into Brussels, there is no checks. You just you're it's free movement. There is no checks. There's no facility to check. There's no scanning procedure. There will be no border control at all because uh, free movement within Europe. It's only what, because we're Ireland, we're in the Schengen, we're outside Ireland that we do have the checks. So I would think. Just to do the DA uh, question there, that it'll be the, the checks will have to be at the departure. Will, well, will have to be the departure for most European airlines. But in Ireland, we have we will be going through an, a, a second check in, in in the European airport that we arrive in. So, um, so I, I think. Sorry, sorry, but just to come back on clarity. Like, which entity will, or do you know which entity will be, I suppose, overseeing this in the airport? So, in at departure. 
at departure, four four people arriving, traveling out. Who will, I suppose, who will be overseeing this? So what's envisaged at the moment is is that it is that it is at check in. So it is the airline at check in who, who will be checking. But the, you know, as uh, as Monica said, the Council of Ministers is evolving policy rapidly, and you know, it is like it, it is a changing situation. It's also a change a situation of reducing risk all the time. So every week in Ireland, we're vaccinating quarter of a million. 300,000 people are getting a vaccine and the same across Europe at that rate. So every, so the, the, the you know, the, the, our number is reducing across, the, the risk is reducing. And at the same time, then we have this danger that another variant could emerge somewhere that could interrupt all of that. So we, it's an evolving situation very rapidly. Um, rules are changing, policy is changing and it's, it, it's difficult to keep up. Okay, and Billy Keller, I know you have to unfortunately leave us very, uh, very soon. But just on that point, I suppose, it has come a lot up a lot in the discussions that I suppose national governments, um, you know, they're keen to protect the health comp competency and be able to reimpose restrictions. But that surely is understandable, given that they're managing the situation on the ground, um, and need to have that latitude to be able to respond to the crisis as things evolve. Yes, well, I, I have no difficulty with member states having an entitlement to respond, and there it's their duty to respond to a health crisis, uh, but. It should be benchmarked on the same uniformity across the European Union. So we should use the benchmark of the European Centre for Disease Control. That would be my observations on this. Otherwise, very quickly, you could have different views of what is an epidemiological uh, difficulty in a country. But that may have, another country may have a different interpretation of that. So very quickly, you could have massive fragmentation of, 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 of this uh, concept of free movement of people. So I would be very, very hopeful or uh, requesting at the very least that member states would assess the epidemiological situations in their own countries based on the European Centre for Disease Control. And at least that would be a benchmark that yeah. every citizen and entity could, for, could base themselves on then. Otherwise, look, we will have that challenge. But I think that, look, there's a, there will be teething problems. There will be significant challenges when people go to other countries. There may be changes uh, in terms of the testing procedures. Um, that, 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 that is all a risk. But if we had at least a template on uh, what governments and health authorities will base their assessment of risk uh, on a uniformity across the European Union, that would be a good start at the very least. A template. Okay. And how can we achieve that? Maybe, Sophie, I'll bring that to you since you've been following negotiations. How can we achieve a template that I suppose all EU member states um, can I suppose, agree to so that we can see a unified approach across all EU member states? Well... It's not that difficult, huh? all it takes is political will. They have already taken a decision last year, October, as I said, to all That's work right. on the basis of the same uh, color-coded map. And then in practice, they don't. <laughs> so, uh, as I said, all it takes is a, is a decision and then member states sticking to that, to that decision. That's all it takes. So, But the point is that they, they've turned it into a kind of power battle between the national level and the and the European level, and then there's some member states like Germany, for example, which is a federal country, or or Sweden, where the local authorities are very important uh, uh, powers in the area. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that's been that's also been um, you know they have also been arguing, which which meant a delay in the introduction of the uh, certificate. Um, so, but I think those things shouldn't come into it. We have a fundamental right to freedom of movement in the European Union, uh, and it is being impeded, not so much by the virus, but very much by the disagreement between uh, the member states. It's, it's, not, it's not necessary. So I hope that if indeed next week <coughs> they are going to, as it were, renew that decision, renew that recommendation, that this time they will actually follow it uh, and ease the travel for people in summer. Because I think, you know, uh, apart from work travel and family travel, I think people really, really deserve a break. <laughs> I'd say a lot of tourism and hospitality sectors will be delighted to hear you say that. Okay, I'm going to quick fire through as many questions as I can as I have so many here and I'm conscious that people have tuned in and they, you know, they want to hear from our panel here. So if I can start maybe with Monica, you might be able to help, um, respond to this question. So if we just keep the answers brief and I'll be able to get through as many as I can. So starting a role in Luxembourg with EU institutions in September, congratulations. We're hoping to be able to fly home each weekend 
in the initial couple of months before relocation due to family commitments. Is this feasible, do you think? So, Monica, that's a question for you. Sorry, I didn't understand. So, but whether you, you will be able to, to travel within uh, the um, union again? Yes, yeah, so this is an Irish person or somebody living in Ireland or an Irish person starting a role in Luxembourg with EU institutions in September. So they're starting a job in Luxembourg and they were hoping to be able to fly home each weekend for the initial couple of months. So initially, you know, fly home every weekend um, due to family commitments. Is this feasible, do you think? Might uh, will also depend a lot from uh, the uh, on the uh, Irish authorities um, because as far as uh, Luxembourg are, c are concerned, there are no restrictions uh, except to taking a test. I think if you fly in, um, but um, as I said, also the epidemiological situation is improving. So I I can only um, appeal to member states uh, if this recommendation is uh, approved next week to as uh, Mrs. Innitfeld said to apply the recommendation as uh, member states all agreed upon. So. Um, and that, that would mean that um, for this uh, green and orange uh, regions, uh, only a test, uh, sorry, for green red regions, no restrictions at all. And for orange and red regions, only a test would be required. That indeed would then allow to travel back and forth. So it might just be a PCR test to be able to enable them to come back. Yeah, and perhaps just uh, please always have a look at Reopen EU, the website uh, uh, that has been established for this uh, precise purpose. And it is available in all languages that I wanted to say as well, so uh, that people really can find the information they need. So Reopen EU, if you're traveling, that is where you need to go. Okay, Minister, I'm just going to bring you in again. I have a question here from a Canadian student in Ireland. I'm a non-EU student studying in Ireland and might go back to Canada for the summer. I'm fully vaccinated from the HSC, have my vaccination card from them. Would I be eligible to use the COVID certificate so they're Canadian but living in Ireland? And if you're out of the country, is it possible to obtain this certificate? So say if she's in Canada, he or she is in Canada and need a certificate. And will I need the certificate to re-enter Ireland? So three questions there. Yeah, so so, so the, the first question is, is the issue of, of uh, certificates to non-citizens. So I, th I think I referred to that, but you know, you're, you're on holiday somewhere, you need, you need a certificate. So it's, it's certainly we're, we're, we're going to have to find a way to do that. The the other question I think is that you're, you, they're back in Canada and will they need to get, a, 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 will they need a digital COVID certificate to come from Canada to Ireland? Exactly, and the, yeah. And yeah, so the, the, the certificates are, it's, it's an EU travel mechanism and it's, a, it, people are going to arrive into the EU from outside the EU and they're not going to have digital COVID certificates. They're going to have something else. And there were other international um, similar operations or attempts at projects to, to, to come up with mutually recognized certificates going on. I think the WHO has one and, uh, and um, yeah. I, I heard somebody, that, I think you there are these people. Working on one, yeah. 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 So, so, in a, so in practice, in an airport, we're going to have to admit people who don't have a COVID certificate because they came from outside of the EU. So, so who have, you know, who, who arrive with, with something else, with some piece of paper. So, we, this so person's it, vaccinated. So yeah, so probably it's not a. It's, so it's so it's not so exactly. So it's not it's not a silver bullet that everybody at the airport is arriving with these EU COVID certificates. There's going to be a lot of people who don't have them, and they're going to have to be processed as they are processed now. And the rule and what the rules will be for entry to um to the to ireland from canada in a couple of months time is hard it's, it's impossible for me to predict but i do know for example that if you're vaccinated this person is vaccinated yeah if you're vaccinated well, you can see yeah yeah and they have their certificate yeah 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 okay thank you for that minister okay dear Jacqueline, i'm going to come back to you so these are some <laughs> i'm losing uh i'm um tongue-tied. These are some specific questions from different people about how exactly the certificate will work, so maybe you can help um, shed some light on it. So if a child has to be tested within 72 hours of travel and they do not have a mobile phone, then the certificate will hardly arrive by post within the time frame. So they're just concerned about the time frame and the turnaround, particularly if a weekend is involved. So maybe if they get tested on a Friday or a Thursday and you know you have the Saturday and Sunday, Will a parent be allowed to show multiple digital versions from their phone? You know, well, so basically, I think they're concerned that the child mightn't have, um, might get tested later in the week and the turnaround, and then will they, will a parent, I suppose, be able to show digital versions on their phone? Surely a parent will be able to, for a child, will be able to represent them. Yeah, they will. That's right. And, and you can well. also get a paper search anyway, you know, there's a paper option available as well. 
So yeah, um, you so that should, that should be fine. But you have 72 hours. I know it's difficult that, that turnaround, 72 hours to make sure you get the test in time, uh, to give it 24 hours and maybe a little plus to get the results. And then you have to have it um, for landing. It has to be 72 hours for landing, not even from takeoff. So it's quite, you need to put a bit of thought into it. Uh, but all the test centers are available over the weekend. You now, unfortunately, um, that's, um, you're, they're, you're paying for them. So they, so they can, yeah. So you can go and avail of a test every weekend. Yeah. So you yeah, should be yeah, able to yeah. Hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Another question, actually, the minister might be best placed to answer this, and I know we touched on it earlier. But I understand Irish residents can travel from the 19th of July. But when will they be able to apply for the certificate here? So it's if you're vaccinated, you'll receive an email from the HSC. Obviously, if you have recovered from COVID, are you going to receive an email from the HSC? So someone's just wondering if you're going to book a flight. When will you be able to apply for this certificate or receive this certificate? All oh, right. So, in other words, the answer to that is before the nineteenth of July. So, I, I I don't know exactly what date they're going to be issued, but they are going to be issued in time. Going to, okay. Okay. Thank you, Minister. And question three: Who will be responsible for what in Ireland regarding the issuing of COVID certificate agency, and will it be managed? manage the process of issuing the document so we've touched on that earlier the hsc will oversee it they will email you if you've been vaccinated or if you've recovered from covid you should receive it before the 19th of july for actually minister just come back to you for those who haven't been vaccinated i suppose their two avenues are you either receive a pcr test or um i suppose if you haven't been vaccinated so and then what if you've recovered from covid in terms of and or in terms of antibodies What's their their status there? If you've recovered from COVID, how will they? Will the HSC also notify them? Give them a yes. COVID? So so so, yeah. so we we estimate like from our COVID testing system in Ireland, we estimate that we have a quarter of a million people that we can identify as people who te who previously tested uh, positive for COVID but have since recovered, and so we we're in a position to to issue those. I, uh, is your question about serology tests and and having an antibody test on people who may have the antibodies for whatever reason? Yes, just to prove. So, so essentially, if you've recovered from COVID, your proof that I suppose that you've had COVID within the nine nine months. What will what will be I suppose the correct criteria in order to be able to prove that? Uh, so, so I guess the we if if we have tested you in the last nine months and mm -hmm. you've tested positive, if the agency has tested you and you've tested positive, and the appropriate amount of time, there's a number of days afterwards that's counted as the recovery period. Then they then they they will email you and offer you a recovery certificate. Mm -hmm. They, there is a list of approved that there is also a possibility of antibody tests or serology tests and there's a list of approved tests and a list of approved antigen tests and there's a, and that the EU has defined a, a list of particular types of tests which can be included on the certificate and so any country that's accepting those tests as as admittance for uh, their country you can you can get that on your certificate okay thank you very much minister well, we're coming to the end of our session. I'm going to put my last question to Sophie. I suppose we've got into a lot of the technicalities and I hope a lot of our attendees and guests got a better sense of how this I suppose, system is going to work. And hopefully everybody will be able to fly again and have a good experience and that this will be a great success. But Sophie, I suppose, how important is this from an economic perspective in terms of the recovery of the EU economy? Maybe if we can just finish on that. Well, uh... I think very important. Of course, this is not the only element. Fortunately, the European economy doesn't depend exclusively on uh, the introduction of this certificate, but uh, it's it's going to help a lot. First of all, because <coughs> because the tourism season is starting, uh, and, and and many countries, in particular in the south of Europe, uh, really need tourism. Uh, and secondly, there are just there are a lot of people who are you know working. And living across the border uh just think of the transport sectors and of course they've created these green lanes and what have you uh but there's still a lot of obstacles uh and that is going to be uh, a lot easier but in the end i think this is not just about the economy this is also about the right of people uh to you know the right to to free movement but also the right to to family reunification uh, the right even to, you might even say, to mental health, because I, I think what I just said, we all need a break. Um, I, that's very serious. I sometimes hear people say, oh, but, you know, this is only for people who want to go on holidays. It's a luxury. Well, I think particular for 
particularly for people who who may have lost their jobs or their income, uh, you know, who've spent a year and a half uh, cooped up in a small apartment with lots of kids. I think they, for their mental health, they desperately need a break and a change of scenery and uh, to take a breath. So I think it's important for uh, for our economy, but it's also extremely important for our collective well-being, I think. Okay, and on that note, I will finish there. Thank you very much to Monica, to the Minister Oshin Smith, to Sophie, and to Deirdre. We are very grateful for the seminar, and I hope it's given the guests and attendees a, a better insight into what they, what they can expect uh, from the 1st of July, for the EU rollout of the EU COVID digital certificate or the EU digital COVID certificate and from the 19th of July here in Ireland. So thank you very much from Dublin.